Thanksgiving, Nashville and beyond. Happy Turkey Day. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Uh, as you are spending time with family and friends, I hope that it is uh, going well. We've got a cool episode today for you to just uh, maybe you maybe you need to get away from the fam and just uh, just relax, put the AirPods in and uh, listen to a good podcast. We've got one for you today if you need that escape. But if uh, if you're if you're hanging out with family, you're having a good time. Uh, everybody remember to think Brad. If you're thinking Nashville, think Brad. You can reach Brad over at Brad underscore Reynolds underscore Nashville on Instagram or text and call him. Tell him happy Thanksgiving over at 615-856-3270. And of course, you can find Brad over at thinkbrad.com. All right. So a few years ago, we did a episode with one of the historians that work for Fort Nagley. And we started this series yesterday. So this is part three of a multi-part series. Oh, we started it two days ago. Oh, two days ago. I'm yeah. Confused. I'm confused by the days. Uh, so this is part three of a multi-part series. And this is diving deep into what, what, what was Fort Nagley, especially during the time of the Battle of Nashville. I don't want to ruin anything for you. So just take a listen to this. This is absolutely incredible. All right. Our guest today is Kristen Castillo. Uh, she is the museum coordinator at Fort Negley. And so, Krista, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We are excited. Uh, we love Fort Negley, so we're excited to have you here. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yes. Okay, so we are at Fort Negley, and, uh, you know, we're just going to pretend like, you know, we don't know what Fort Negley is. We're, we've, you know, there's this giant lump of 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 grass dirt, <laughs> dirt and grass you know in this downtown area and you know you drive Why past a skyscraper there yeah you, yeah you drive down the interstate and you're like there's just a big giant hill in mm -hmm. downtown and there's probably a lot of people who are not familiar with this area so what exactly is fort negley all right um well i'll take you Way back to prehistory, okay. Uh, back to when uh, Tennessee was a tropical shallow sea. All right. About 500 million years ago. I like that. Um, so we had all of these little uh, sea creatures dying, falling to the bottom, um, condensing over time uh, due to pressures. Uh, we have, so it created all of this limestone. Oh wow! When the Nashville Basin eroded away the really hard stuff like the limestone didn't erode. So we were left with these basically solid limestone knobs. Um, and one of those is St. Cloud Hill, which, which is uh, what Fort Nagley is today. Um, so Fort Nagley Park is about 60 acres. Um, we have very little surface soil here because it is really solid limestone. Yeah. Um, and the... So it's a it's a you know a public green space in a rapidly developing urban area, and then right in the in the the center point of the park um, is the remains of a federal fort built during the Civil War. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, that's really cool to to learn about its history even before uh, the Civil War. Um, <laughs> and people said Nashville never had a beach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was, was this private land before the Civil War? It was. Okay. It was. Uh, so you're probably familiar with Traveler's Rest. Yep. So Judge John Overton began buying up property in Nashville um, in the early 1800s. And St. Cloud Hill was one of those properties that he purchased. Um, we really have no idea where the name St. Cloud Hill came from. Um, that's one of the, the big mysteries, but, um, but no one lived here. So it was basically prior to the civil war, a popular picnic area. Okay. Um, so even though it is so close to downtown, it offered people living in the city, um, an escape from all the disease and filth. Mm. So it, it was a nice little day trip yeah. for people. Yeah. What's the, uh, elevation of St. Cloud Hill? It's about 260 feet above okay. the Cumberland River. So okay. it is not Nashville's highest hill, mm -hmm. but it ah, is one okay. of them. I was about to say, it's probably pretty close. I mean, you can the, you can see a lot from Fort Negley, but mm -hmm. you, there's also a lot of points that you can see close to Fort Negley that are, mm -hmm. that are pretty high mm -hmm. in Nashville. What made Fort Negley the spot 
that was chosen in, uh, to build a federal fort on? Um, well, it is, lo- it is located very close to, um, to railroad lines. Okay. The railroad lines are, are just at the base of the hill, separating us from Nashville City Cemetery. Yeah. And then you have all of these southern pikes also converging. So you have mm. Franklin Pike, Murfreesboro Pike, Nolensville Pike, all within sight range of Fort Negley. Um, and the southern approaches to the city uh, is what was really important to protect because there were so many federal gunboats on the river. Mm-hmm. An attack from the north was really, um, would have would have been pretty unlikely. So yeah. they were really concerned yeah. with watching those southern approaches. Yeah, we recently, uh, in doing an episode of this podcast, one of our earlier episodes, we uh, learned the design of the, the city and went through some of the, the plans and how people were designing the city. We learned a lot of the pikes were built from buffalo trails. Mm-hmm. That, so uh, it's it's pretty cool to see a lot of Nashville history kind of coming together and everything mm-hmm. because it, 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 it all connects. It's really cool to see. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, maybe Nashville just right before... Uh, it, it's it's time of actually occupation and everything. What mm-hmm. was Nashville like uh, right before uh, either the Civil War or right before its occupation? That is a, that's a really fascinating question. Um, Nashville was really unlike other southern cities. Okay. It was very cosmopolitan, um, a large emphasis on education and arts, um, and, and what made it so desirable to the military uh, were all of those large buildings mm-hmm. that went oh. along with that. Yeah. So um, they, they can store stuff in the warehouses exactly. and everything. Exactly. Okay. St- store stuff and troops. Um, another, uh, so, you ha- so you have all of this focus on arts and education, but then at the same time, you have this slave system Mm -hmm. that was also unique to Nashville in the way that you had a combination of enslaved people, free people, and then quasi free people. Okay. Which means there were slaves that were being rented out and they were essentially living on their own, but their wages were going back to their masters. Mm. Um, And because you had this very strange combination of slaves and free people, there was a lot of concern um, from the founding of Nashville all the way up to the Civil War that, you know, some of these enslaved people and quasi-free people would start getting ideas from the other free people. And they they might want to start an insurrection. Yeah. Um, so really, um, everyone... Everyone that was considered um, by the Nashville elites to be kind of um, undesirable were were pushed out beyond the capital in the area of the old um, prison, Tennessee State okay. Prison. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so it it was a really interesting and complex society, um, one that y- you read. Um, stories of visitors who came, and th- there's a definite division between the very wealthy and the very poor, mm. and there doesn't seem to be like that in between. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think one of the most you know startling images if is you have all of the, these people living around this this opulent capital in the 1850s. This opulent capital building. Right. What was the population of, around this time? So it um, in eighteen sixty, it was about seventeen thousand. Okay. So you have you have this this opulence on the on Capitol Hill and then surrounding Capitol Hill, and all of this is in view of the people that are living in absolute poverty, and the people that are that are living in what quickly became known as Hell's Half Acre, are walking to jobs. That's, that, that's a hill that's down from the Tennessee State Capitol, correct? Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you have them, you know, you have people walking to work in the mansions and the hotels and the restaurants, and they're walking right past 
the slave dealers and the slave jail wow. because everything mm. was congregated around that Capitol Hill. Wow. wow. So it, it was a extremely interesting time and um, shockingly, Hell's Half Acre existed well into the 1970s. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's the photos. I've seen the historic photos. Mm-hmm. They are insane it's, looking. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, it's, it's extremely sad. So how did Nashville become a Confederate city then? So Nash- or Tennesseans initially voted against secession. Mm-hmm. Uh, but following the, the surrender of Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for 75,000 troops... Uh, the state had a re-vote in June 1861, and the state voted to secede. Um, Nashville was a bit divided. Um, there were there were unionists, unionist slave owners, secessionists, obviously secessionist slave owners. Um, once the state voted to secede, a lot of a lot of the unionists left to Nashville. Um, but there was still there was still a lot of division. Um, so it was obviously um, Nashville became the capital of a of a seceded state. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of. Um, You know, it, it, there was a lot of tension. It was a very, very much decided city, it, divided city. It literally was in Nashville, like in other places, brother against brother, mm. oh, neighbor wow. against neighbor. Okay. Yeah. You know, people who had been best friends forever were suddenly against each other. Yeah. Um, you know, anyone displaying um, any kind of, of patriotism toward the United States was was immediately suspect. Mm. Um Unfortunately, or fortunately, depend on how you look at the outcome of the Civil War, <laughs> um, as, in, as important as Nashville was, the Confederacy did virtually nothing to secure the city okay. or, the, or really the state. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So they built forts um, Henry and Donaldson, to the northwest of Nashville, they really relied on Kentucky's neutrality okay. to protect the South. Okay. Um, yeah. The Confederates started establishing the supply base here uh, right around the time of that secession vote. Uh, when the when the fall of Fort Donelson occurred, there were about seven thousand Confederate troops in Nashville. Oh wow! And yeah. The fall of Fort Donaldson came as a a complete shock to citizens in Nashville. They went to bed the night before believing that it was in the bag. The Confederacy had won. They got up the next morning. They went to church. Church services are interrupted. They're told Fort Donaldson has fallen. The federal army is marching this way. The gunboats are coming. And and panic broke out yeah how many soldiers did the federal army have at fort donaldson was it over twenty five thousand? i think that's a good question i okay. have to look that up Sorry. but no that's okay so how when they, so the confederates had the city of occupied mm-hmm. and most of those uh, troops or soldiers were stationed near capitol hill correct at the time of when the confederates were occupying mm-hmm. nashville mm-hmm. so when the union or the federal army came into nashville what did that look like? So it took it took almost two weeks oh, for wow. them to arrive from that announcement. From, right from yeah. that announcement, um, and so in the meantime, you have Confederate soldiers who had been at Fort Donaldson trickling in, and you know they're hungry, they're tired, um, battle worn, and they're telling. They're telling the public all of these things like they're coming, they're going to burn down the city, they're going to bomb the city. Um, And the Confederate Army decides to live to fight another day, and they start preparing to move out. Mm -hmm. Um, So they are taking, you know, the the stores, the rations, they're they're, uh, confiscating 
every train car, every civilian cart, yeah. you know, everything they can find to take their supplies further south. Hmm. Um, and the public, uh, rightly so, starts panicking. It, it appears that they're taking all of the food out of the city. So they're not staying around to fight. No, no, no. There were only about 7,000 here. So, so they knew they would not stand they a chance. They did. Wow. Um, and at the same time, the the state legislature moves out. Huh. The governor leaves. Oh my goodness! They take the um, they take the archives with them. Wow. They decide that they're going to reconvene in Memphis. Oh my goodness! So the state government essentially abandons the civilians wow. in Nashville. Um, so you're left with the with um, the city government to make a decision on what to do. Um, and they have people at this time have all of this knowledge about the, the wars and the revolutions in Europe. Right. And they certainly don't want to, you know, turn out to be a Moscow where their yeah, yeah. city is completely <laughs> burned to the ground. Right. So they decide very early on that they are going to surrender when troops arrive. Hmm. Wow. Gosh, that's a, uh that's interesting to, to see like an entire capital just pretty much abandoned. Yes, and the descriptions are pretty amazing. Just people fleeing as fast as they can. Um, you know, men riding on top of train cars, women and children inside train cars. Um, many of um, the big supporters of the Confederacy. Uh, the big plantation owners, the men fled south, leaving their, their wives families, yeah. and their children behind um, huh. to to take care of the take care of everything at home and secure their property. All right, so you know now the federal army is in Nashville. Mm -hmm. What's you know? the what's the date of this during the Civil War? This is February twenty fifth and twenty sixth. Okay, gotcha. In eighteen sixty two. Eighteen sixty two. And so, obviously, now the federal army mm -hmm. has to, you know, find some way to defend Nashville. Yes. And I'm guessing this is how Fort Negley came into existence. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the federal army comes in. They completely lock down the city. So mm. newspapers are shut down. Mail is is not getting in or out. Wow. People are not allowed to leave. Um, it's... It's this effort to try to root out who is loyal to the federal government and who is not. Hmm. Because uh, Abraham Lincoln fully believed that the unionists in Nashville were being oppressed. They were in the majority, but they were being oppressed by the secessionists. Okay. And all they needed was someone to come in and encourage them yeah. to stand up. Gotcha. And what they found was that um, there was definitely more secessionist fervor than they imagined. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So okay. um, Andrew Johnson is appointed military governor okay. of Tennessee because he uh, was a senator from Tennessee, the only senator from a seceding state that it did not resign his position. Oh, wow. He was a slave owner, but he was also a unionist. Um, so he was very much like, an olive branch. Yeah. You know, we're going to send you one of your own. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, outside of East Tennessee, Johnson was not well liked. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Johnson um, was a, very much had a hand with the fortifying of Nashville. Okay. Um, so throughout the the late winter, spring, and summer, um, there was a lot of Confederate irregular activity in the countryside. Um, so people that, that weren't necessarily associated with the Confederate Army, but operating Rogue. within the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also you had you had people like Nathan Bedford Forrest yeah. constantly threatening to recapture the city. Um, but you have war heating up farther south. You need soldiers on in the field. Um, so at the time, the best way to do to protect a large amount of territory was to build fortifications. Okay. Okay. So um, by May 1862, uh, James St. Clair Morton 
was promoted to um, chief engineer of the Army of the Ohio, later Army of the Cumberland. Okay. He came to Nashville, um, personally chose the sites that would be used for the fortifications. Um, the work began in August. Um, the, the labor force was comprised primarily uh, by free African Americans, enslaved people, and um, self-emancipated people. Okay. okay, gotcha. So when throughout that spring and summer, um, what what the federal army did was essentially create pockets of free soil in the South, hmm. okay. making escape a lot more attainable for yeah. enslaved so if you, populations. If you built a fortifications, you could become a freeman. Right. Okay. Right. So, so you have you have soldiers congregating on these hills that have been chosen for the fortifications. Right. Which is welc- very welcoming to enslaved people. So you kind of have um, you have people coming in and rebuilding their lives, trying to rebuild new lives and freedom at the same time that yeah. the army is planning to build these fortifications. Yeah. Um, so that's where, uh, the labor force comes from. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and you know, it, enslaved, it, enslaved people are often portrayed, at least that's been my experience in school, that enslaved people were portrayed as just passive bystanders who were handed freedom earned by others. Right. There's not a whole lot of talk about anything else. Exactly. But what you find at Fort Negley, the rest of the fortifications in Nashville um, and in other occupied cities is that enslaved people made calculated decisions. Yeah. They were, you know, they were getting information. They, they understood um, that if they left the plantation, they were walking into complete uncertainty. Mm-hmm. They had never seen northerners before. They didn't know if they were sympathetic to their plight. Right. Um, even though the distances were drastically reduced, they still had to be on the lookout for slave catchers, uh, masters tracking them. Um, they knew once they left the plantation, it was likely they would never see their family again. Hmm. Uh, they knew that they were um, walking into a situation where uh, there was overwhelming disease, yeah. lack of supplies, hmm. uh, lack of housing. Um, so they really made those um, those difficult choices. Um, and what's really amazing, um, Dr. Thomas Flagel, who's a professor at Cumberland Community College, did his dissertation and found that um, the majority of slaves who successfully escaped were women and children. Wow. Because wow. women understood that the law at the yeah. time said your condition of slavery was based on your mother's condition of slavery. Oh, so they wow. understood if they could get themselves freedom, they could get their their children and all future children, sorry, all future children to freedom. Yeah, it makes me yeah. think of uh, Harriet Tubman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really um, understood and made some extremely difficult decisions. And I think one of the one of the you know really frustrating things that I hear. Um, much more often than I'd like, is, well, you know, they were better off in slavery. Hmm. And hmm. that's just, I mean, that's incomprehensible. I mean. Yeah. Right. They didn't take those risks for no reason. Exactly. Right. Huh. Exactly. And I, you know, and I, I sometimes want to ask people, you know, that say that, like, are you saying you would volunteer? Is that. <laughs> right. You know, I, yeah. so, I mean, we don't we don't understand what it's like to not be free. We were born free. Right. We really can't judge. <laughs> yeah, others. exactly. Uh, while we're on this topic, mm-hmm. um, I remember, you know, I think a lot of people had read in the news, uh, 
a little while ago, a few years ago, a year or two ago, that there were things that were found on this property, you know, during the, was it the demolition of Greer Stadium? Um, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Uh, so um, in 2016, 2017, um, the city of Nashville attempted to open up the portion of Fort Negley Park um, previously occupied by Greer Stadium for private development. Okay. Um, so, of course, um, a number of historians, preservationists, concerned citizens um, began questioning that because even uh, when it was decided in the 1970s to build Greer Stadium, um, you know, it was it was seems to have been pretty common knowledge that there was a that that had been Civil War burial ground. Oh yeah. wow! Prior, yeah. okay. Um, so the city hired um, an archaeologist, Tennessee Val Valley Archaeology Archaeological Research. Um, they conducted a survey, and what they found was a high likelihood of human remains. Okay. So fortunately, when the athletic park was built by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s and 40s, they brought in several feet of fill dirt, okay. which protected those archaeological deposits. Oh, interesting. And then through ground penetrating radar, the archaeologists also found anomalies um, that could be interpreted as graves. Okay. okay. Gotcha. So phase two of the of the survey is set to begin next month. And oh, wow. hopefully we will get more data on that property and what kind of remains are over there. Okay. How long uh, are they estimating phase two to take? Uh, maybe a month, six weeks. Okay. Is any of this ground penetrating? That I'm not sure about. Okay. I know they will be digging test pits gotcha. at this point. Right. Um, they did dig some test pits as part of that 2017 survey okay. as well, okay. um, but did not recover any human remains. Gotcha. Uh, what we do know is that because of the number of deaths in Nashville during the Civil War, the city cemetery could not hold everybody hold everyone yeah, right. so additional cemeteries had to be consecrated right and we know that um some of those are within fort negley park's border borders okay so gotcha. there's a, there were an estimated forty thousand people buried in nashville during the civil war wow oh. and we only know um we only have records on about fifteen thousand of those oh my goodness. which were uh, largely federal soldiers and some Confederate soldiers. Hmm. So civilians, we really don't we don't know a whole lot about where they are. Okay, yeah. Um, so going back to the fort, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about uh, you know a lot of its its labor force and everything. The design of the fort is actually something that is pretty cool and it's is mm -hmm. pretty special about Fort Negley. Uh, do you want to talk about the, the design of, of Fort Negley and how it took its shape? Yeah. So what's really incredible, um, and it, for, for us living in 2019, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around how slowly technology developed even 150 years ago. Okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so it was 17th century fortification design that was being taught at West Point okay. Okay. in the years preceding the Civil War. So James St. Clair Morton, chief engineer for the um, Army of the Cumberland, um, was a West Point graduate and learned these um, really you know, medieval techniques. And techniques, styles. yes. So, um, but... James St. Clair Morton was, was a brilliant engineer, and he and others recognized that 
artillery technology was developing. Okay. And that masonry fortifications would not be able to withstand that kind of firepower. Hmm. So he started leaning more towards, well, really not leaning. I mean, he was a, um, a devoted advocate of earthen fortifications. Okay. But when he got to St. Cloud Hill, because of the very little soil, <laughs> he had no choice but yeah. to revert back to the to the masonry fortification. Interesting. Um, so Fort Negley has been called a star fort, but really it is Morton's own design. That's okay. why okay. you can look at star forts all around the world and you're not going to find one that looks like Fort Negley. Right. It's because he combined a star fort with a bastioned fort. Okay. So the bastions um, are those two protrusions at the front yes oh, so the big towers um kind of. no so they would be um these right here okay and so those were uh interlocking chambers um that allowed soldiers to keep an eye on those southern approaches so no one's will pike murfreesboro mm -hmm. okay yeah and not be um and be protected from enemy fire. Gotcha. Uh, the soldiers referred to those, to those bastions as tunnels, but they are not subterranean. They're on the okay. surface. Right. So that's one of the um, that's one of the misconceptions that have been handed down that there are tunnels on the property. There may be, but we've been all over this property. Right. We have never found a tunnel. Right. We, we would if we had found a tunnel, we would be really <laughs> excited about that. Um, so the so those star points are called redans. Okay. Each one of those would have held a cannon, and the cannon uh, had the ability to be pivoted 180 degrees to to allow for um, overlapping fields of fire. Okay. Um, Was this like a six foot cannon? Because I know like the different size cannons mattered. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the re uh, unfortunately the reports. Uh, and the inspections that are done are are not exactly clear. So um, there's one inspection that says there are 11 heavy guns. Okay. Well, the definition of a heavy gun is a gun that you put in a fortification. Okay. <laughs> so what that gun is yeah. is questionable. <laughs> um, you know, and, and Fort Negley's artillery changed over time so there were you know field guns and mortars the two largest guns uh would have been 30 pound parrot guns okay and those would have come at least um by early to mid 1864 uh they were uh contained within the casemates which were um basically bomb proofs made out of earth wood and railroad iron um those uh, cannons, which were also present at the state capitol and other forts around Nashville, okay. um, the tube was 11 feet long and weighed about 4,200 pounds. Wow. And that could fire a 30-pound projectile uh, about three and a half miles. Oh my wow. Gosh. Not necessarily with accuracy. Right. Okay. So they were yeah. accurate about two miles. That's not um, bad. There was a 100-pound parrot gun on wow. the river. Okay. And unfortunately, I, I don't know the, the weight of what that tube would have been. Gotcha. Um, but we're talking about some pretty, pretty massive cannons. Aggressive, cannon. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how did the design, uh, did it seem to really uh, hold its weight as far as battle when it was battle tested, did it seem to do well? Yeah, and I think I think what it what it did so well was it was extremely intimidating. Okay. It okay. it was not yeah. something like because it was complex. Well, it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Yeah, no one had seen anything like this. Hmm. So on. Um, 
Kirkpatrick Hill, where the city reservoir is today, okay. there was a, a small wooden blockhouse. Um, on Curry's Hill, where uh, Rose Park is on Edge Hill Avenue, okay. was Fort Morton. Fort Morton was a very low profile earthen fort. Yes. Okay. So it blended yeah. into the landscape. That's cool. And then, you know, within close proximity, you have this absolutely massive fort of wood, railroad iron, stone, earth, three levels of defense, <laughs> yeah. bristling with cannon. You know, it's it's visible from downtown. It's visible from the Capitol building. Um, there was an 80-foot flagpole in the center, and they flew the the biggest American flag they could get their hands on. So wow. for miles around, there was there was no question about who held control of Nashville. Now I guess let's let's talk about the events that led to an actual battle here okay. in in Nashville. You know, um, we we had talked about um, this uh, previously. We had on uh, some people from the Battle of Franklin Trust, mm -hmm. and we talked about the Battle of Franklin. Franklin, and obviously, uh, this is right before the Battle of Nashville. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the the events that led up to a battle actually happening here in the city? Um, so, Hood had been promising his Army of Tennessee that they would return and recapture Nashville. Yes. Um, I always think of you know MacArthur and his. I will return speech. Yeah, yeah. You know when he left the Philippines. Um, so this was this was Hood's promise, uh, a promise that he was obviously um, undeterred to keep after devastating losses at Franklin. So the the Army of Tennessee leaves Franklin, uh, arrives uh, or leaves Franklin on November thirtieth, arrives in Nashville on December first and starts digging in. Well, from the time they start digging in, the fortifications in Nashville are firing on them oh, wow. almost oh, nonstop. Constantly. So it was, bombard constantly. it was bombardments? It was bombardment. For, okay. Oh, yes, for because the Battle of Nashville was on the 15th and 16th. Okay. Yeah. So they are being constantly bombarded. Um, Were they losing casualties at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and, you know, here they are... Um, you know, they've just been through this horrendous battle in Franklin. Then they march all this way, shoeless, many of them coatless. They, are, they have hardly any rations to go, along, to go around. They arrive in Nashville. A, a winter storm sets in with sleet and ice and freezing rain. And they're told to start digging trenches. And by the way, you can't have campfires because the, <laughs> the fort... cannons can see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, so you can imagine how frustrated and angry yeah. a lot of these Confederate soldiers did. I mean, it's it's amazing to me that you know when the battle actually started, they were willing to move. <laughs> I think I would have been like, sorry. Yeah. I, like, I'm gonna go get some food. Yeah, and, uh, I, I can't. I can't go without food and shoes for this long. Yeah, and expect me to fight. Um, so it was. It was really miserable. And of course, during that two weeks, you have uh, General George Thomas is just amassing more and more troops. Yeah. in Nashville and just building, you know, strengthening their fortifications, building fortifications. There's one newspaper report in the days leading up to the battle where, you know, a group, civilians would go out to the uh, entrenchments, you know, beyond Fort Negley um, and just want to gawk at the army. Oh, and my goodness. Wow. They were snatched up, handed axes, pickaxes <laughs> and shovels and put to work. Wow. So you, didn't, you did not want to... You did not want to look like you had nothing to do around this time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, How big was the defense line for the Federal Army? Uh, by the Battle of Nashville, it ended up being around 20 miles. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's maybe a mile left okay. in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so if, if you're someone living outside of the city and you know this battle is coming, I mean, you're pretty, you're pretty panicked. You know, you're trying to find right. somewhere else to go. Right. And what normally is going to happen is you don't go far enough. Right. Yeah. And the battle's going to end up finding you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but for people in Nashville, that two weeks leading up to the battle, the circus was in town. Like and the this, actual legitimate the, circus. The actual circus. Wow. And they are selling out every show. Oh, my goodness. The circus is performing on the 15th and 16th. People are at the circus. So you can hear the cannon fire and the music exactly. of the circus. Exactly. So oh I mean, I think that really gives you an idea of how successful these fortifications were. That if you're an average civilian, you're thinking about getting your ticket to the circus. You're not thinking about it being interrupted oh my by gosh. a battle. Wow. Um, so, I mean, without these fortifications... The federal army would not have been able to hold this city. Right. Um, and, and I think of Fort Negley in a lot of ways like, you know, a, a, a tangible example of psychological warfare. Hmm. I mean, you're, you are going about your business in downtown Nashville and you can see this. You can see this massive <laughs> yeah, fort on the, the hill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and in addition, you have a military governor in Andrew Johnson who is fond of reminding the civilians, you join forces with Confederates coming in and out of the city because mm-hmm. the lines were porous. Right. You know, people were getting through. And we will open up our guns on you. Hmm. We... No hesitation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, a, and, and really, you know, by 1863 or so, you see citizens in Nashville and the federal army kind of settling into everyday life. Every, yeah. Okay. I mean, they've become like, it's not 1862 anymore where they're angry that federal soldiers are in their churches. You know, it's like, right. You know, well, this is life. This is life. The city is protected. You know, we don't, we don't have to take worry about battles taking place Mm. downtown. Um, you know, there were, of course there were always, um, issues between the army and civilians. Like, well, they're not issuing us enough passes to get out in and out of the city or things like that. But, I mean, it really, of course, after uh, some uh, event or something, there there would be crackdowns on civilians. Okay. You know, there were there were a lot of smugglers in town, so it's like, well, we broke up the smuggling ring, so now we're going to crack down on civilians. But they hmm. had really settled in, and by that point, they also had a very clear idea of how devastating this war had become, and they didn't want that in Nashville. Mm. I mean, people did right. not want a Battle of Nashville yeah. to take place. Right. They were not... I mean, I mean, even some people that had been the most ardent secessionists were like, please, Hood, do not try this. Yeah. Do not endanger the city like this. Wow. How many men did Hood have when the Battle of Nashville actually started? Uh, he had about 30,000. Okay. And then how many men were here uh, guarding Nashville? About 55. 55,000. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, and not only were there more men, but they were well supplied. And trained. And trained. And, yeah. And fresh. Um, you know, the Battle of Nashville is the the largest use of U.S. color troops. Oh, wow. wow. Up okay. to that time. Wow. And it's the Battle of Nashville where U.S. color troops really proved themselves hmm. on, on the battlefield. And it, there were, um, you know, there were units at Fort Negley that were kept on reserve that, okay. that didn't even... Wow. Didn't even get to the battle lines. How, ma- yeah. how many people would have been stationed at Fort Nagley during the Battle of Nashville? 
Um, so Fort Nagley was built for a thousand men. Okay. So a thousand men within the walls. And then there would have been a soldier's camp right outside of the, the Sally port. And then, um, down the hill. So um, we're uh, kind of, is that where Adventure Science Center mm-hmm. is today? Yeah. In okay. that area. Okay. okay. And gotcha. then beyond the soldier's camp would have been the African American labor camp. Okay. That stretched all the way to Franklin Pike, eighth Avenue. Oh, wow. Dang. That's a lot. Of so <laughs> there were, so there were thousands of people on this hill. Um, the other thing by 1864, and it, this is this is completely amazing to us. Um, there were the exchange barracks, uh, which was used to to in process and, and out process troops. Okay. But according to the reports, this was an absolutely huge complex. Hmm. Huge. I mean, the, something like the the dining hall served 2,500 men. Oh I mean, something gosh. like that. And there is, and it is within yards of Fort Negley. Wow. There's absolutely no remnant <laughs> of, of this, this. absolutely yeah. huge complex that wow. was Crazy. built with barracks. For th- There's no photograph of it. Wow. I mean, it's amazing how there were thousands of people on this hill. And today, the largest artifact we found is the canteen behind you. Oh my goodness. I mean, it is amazing how like that human activity has been wiped away and we're, we're not quite sure how, I mean, it goes a lot to like the army doesn't build things. They don't build permanent installations a lot of the time. I mean, even though Fort Negley is, primarily masonry it's a field fortification it is yeah. not a permanent fortification yeah so i i do wonder if they think like wow it's pretty amazing that's still here yeah you know <laughs> that's crazy because because the other forts you know of right. five major fortifications and 21 minor installations in nashville we have fort negley right why do you think wow. that is why do you think we still have fort negley and and not Anything else? You know, that is a good question. Um, I think part of it is that Fort Negley was occupied by federal troops until September 1867. Okay. Um, At that point, anything of value, the wood, the railroad iron, was stripped away and sold. Okay. The cannon were sent out west. Um. So it was really, they really abandoned a stone skeleton Hmm. on the hill. Um, The other forts were, there are reports that that the army and citizens in Nashville began dismantling some of the other forts before Lee surrendered at Appomattox. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That is how effectively destroyed oh the army goodness. of Tennessee was that wow. the civil war ended in middle Tennessee. The civil war ended for Nashville. Wow. So how many casualties was there from the battle of Nashville? Uh, so there were on the federal side, there were about 3000 killed, missing, wounded, um, about 6,000 on the federal side. Um, and, and plus, uh, on the Confederate side, thousands of prisoners of war. Wow. Okay. So with all of these casualties, was this considered the last battle in Tennessee or was there another one towards like Memphis after the battle of Nashville? I mean, I think this really was the, the last one. Yeah. The okay. last major battle. Okay. So what would you say about Fort Negley in its role in the Civil War as a whole? You know, do I mean, this is kind of hard to, to make a guess with, but do you think that without Fort Negley, would, would the Civil War have looked different? I know that's, that's definitely hard to say. I mean, I think, yes, it, would, it definitely would have looked different how necessarily it would have looked different. I mean, I think 
Is there a greater possibility that Confederate forces would have had some success trying to retake the city? Yeah. Um, would it would not having Fort Negley have deprived um, enslaved people? Hmm. Um, you know, something that something that could come to represent. Yeah. Freedom. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where, I mean, I always say there's always been so much focus on battles, battles and leaders. Right. And, you know, there are, there are still historians that think, I mean, they kind of approach Fort Negley like it materialized on December 15th. Mm-hmm. And then it just disappeared after the Battle of Nashville. Yeah. But the story is really that that occupation story. And, you know, and as the research has come out, it's really that um, that story about the enslaved population. I mean, I think you could argue that Fort Negley meant a whole lot more to enslaved people hmm. than it did to even the soldiers yeah. stationed wow. here. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. because yeah. they're here doing their thing, which is, you know, Sit a lot of wait. boredom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of boredom, right. waiting for something to happen, waiting to be transferred to the next place. Right. You know, I mean, it was like, it was a place where soldiers came back and visited like, Oh, this is nostalgic. Look, children, this is this is what I did during the war. Right. But it didn't take on that meaning that it did for African Americans. Hmm. Um, I think it also took on a lot of meaning for um, for Nashvilleans because it, if it was a symbol of freedom for enslaved people, it was absolutely a symbol of oppression for for. Confederates. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and really you'd asked earlier about, you know, how did Fort Negley survive? I mean, that is a good question. I mean, sometimes it seems like divine intervention <laughs> because Nashville has tried to eliminate the sport. Oh wow. So many times over the years. I mean, they they have talked about um a uh, like an auditorium, a a, a military school, mm. a vocational school. They talked about putting the zoo here. Wow. Um, they even talked about quarrying out St. Cloud Hill to fill in another quarry. Oh, my to goodness. To build Flatland. a park there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it, every time, all of those things just seem to fall through. Interesting. So, so so was it was Fort Negley a protected uh during those those federal attempts land, federal was land. it was it protected at that point? No, um it did um it was not given national register designation until 1975. Wow. Oh, really? But um that national re- and that national register designation at the time only covered the eight acres within the ring road that encircles Fort Negley. Wow. So that's why it did not prevent the sound stadium from being built. Right. Um, the agreement with Adventure Science Center came about 10 years earlier. Okay. Okay. So, um, so did the city of Nashville like pay to restore everything or was that federal money? How did that look? Um, it was, Initially, during the um, in 1935, when the Works Progress Administration um, started restoring the fort, that was federal money. Okay. Um, and then the city contributed funds uh, when they created the the athletic park where the Sound Stadium was. Um, but then in 2004. When the when some repairs were done, the boardwalks and interpretation was added, uh, and then when the visitor center was built, that was all city money. Okay, wow. that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, you know what we see today uh, has has been the the hard work of a lot of 
of people, you mm-hmm. know, trying to make sure that this stays mm-hmm. uh, a place where we can discover the history mm-hmm. of Fort Dagley. Uh, what what all is there here on the property uh, for for people to to come and, and see and mm-hmm. experience? So uh, the stonework remains on the hill. Um, we, was that, that, that was left untouched pretty much, or did they have to rebuild that in 1935? Well, that is a good question. That is, that is one of those debates that is still going on. Unfortunately, we don't know how much of the stone remained when the WPA came in. I mean, I can take you up there and show you... Uh, yeah, this stone was quarried during the Civil War. This hmm. stone was quarried during the WPA. Right. Um, but of course, I can't. I have no idea. Like, was that was this Civil War quarried stone in place? Correct. Right. When the WPA came in. Right. Now, some of these stones are absolutely enormous. I right. Mean, three feet, three feet deep. They're enormous. So, I mean, it's and they weigh a lot. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's hard to say how much was up there. Um, in the mid-1990s, an expert with the National Park Service came in and estimated that the fort is about 50-50. Okay. WPA and Civil War era. Um, I do know that the stone, this is, this is, you know, this is not debated, that the stone that the WPA did use was quarried from... Fort Nagley Hill. Oh, okay, so it's, gotcha. So, I mean, in a way that might make things a little bit harder. If they had used, like, <laughs> Indiana limestone, then we would be able to say, oh, well, this is this is exactly right. what the but WPA rebuilt. Pretty but, much indistinguishable. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So so there's, there's the, you know, the original walls that mm-hmm. people can explore obviously not to full height but the, the mm-hmm. walls are still there what else is is uh, available to, to see up there on the hill uh so we have interpretive panels and we have boardwalks so you can actually walk inside the fort yes um we recently completed a cultural landscape report which will lay out and inform a new master plan that will hopefully come very soon. Awesome. Um, so that will give, hopefully give people even more to see or and do because it will uh, reincorporate that formerly leased property back into the park. Right. Oh, wow. And okay. hopefully there will be um, some really exciting additions. Right. Um, we also have a, a small visitor center with a 20-minute film on Fort Negley some interactive exhibits, artifacts on display. Um, We do a number of programs. Um, Some of them are recurring. Some of them are special events. I was about to say, you guys are pretty busy here. Yeah, yeah. So the the National Civil War Roundtable meets here on the second Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock. The Sons of Union Veterans... Camp 62 wow. meets here uh, every other month on the fourth Tuesday at uh, the business meeting is at six. The program is at seven. Okay. Uh, so they will meet again in January. The African-American uh, Historical and Genealogical Society meets here on the first Saturday um, at 9 30, 10 o'clock. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, fossil programs which highlight Fort Negley's uh, geologic past. So have you guys um, found a lot as far as any fossils or mm-hmm. things of significance here? Yeah, so the so when the WPA uh, quarried uh, the the limestone outcroppings located just below the western redans, uh, they revealed some really amazing coral fossils. So there are some huh. giant coral heads that are still in place, um, and there some of the some of those are the most impressive fossils of their kind in the region. Oh wow! So when we decided to um, to have programs on fossils, 
we entered in a partnership with Vulcan Materials Company. Okay. So they actually bring us dump truck loads full of fossil rich sediment from their quarry um, in western Tennessee. Okay. So that is located um, beside the front porch of the visitor center, and people are welcome to come and dig in that pile and take whatever they'd like oh, from that cool. pile. Huh. Um, so that was our way of encouraging people to take fossils from there and yeah. Fort Negley's fossils. <laughs> um, but in the stonework is, is full of fossils as well. Brachiopods, okay. cephalopods, yeah. um, all kinds of things. Wow. Um, our fossil programs have become more popular than our civil war programs. Oh my goodness. Uh, this fall we had about, Around a thousand elementary school kids come through wow. on field trips. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, and those field trips are led by volunteers. Yeah. And they're really great programs. And um, a few weeks, uh, I guess it's been more like a few months ago. I heard a little boy say, "This is the best day of school ever." <laughs> that's you really know? cool. So, I mean, yeah. it's always great when you hear kids that are, you know, like, "Okay, kids, time to get on the bus." No. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's really cool. When they're not, when they're not more concerned about lunch, <laughs> and they they right. don't want to leave, that's right. Yeah, you guys also have reenactments. We do. Yes. So we have we have living history events, um, and our big event is in um, commemoration of the Battle of Nashville. Yes. So this year. Um, it will be on December 14th okay. from 9 to 4, uh, and we will have reenactors on site, and then we will also have um, a number of programs by local historians. Okay, awesome. Um, and if anybody would like to join our email events list, um, they can just contact us at fortnegley at nashville.gov. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I've been to... I think it was maybe 2016. One of the uh, that I, th I think it was that December event, mm -hmm. and it's it's super fun. Like they are dressed and everything oh, yes. to the like. It is per it almost looks perfect. Yeah, yeah. So that's really cool to see. Um, what are some of your favorite parts about Fort Negley on a personal level? Hmm. I mean, there's. I mean, that's hard to pin down. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think, I mean, there's just, there are so many amazing stories Yeah, and it is, it is such a complex story. You know, when I, when I first started here and I was leaving my other job, people said, why would you want to why would you want to go to a civil war site? We already know everything. What else do you <laughs> expect to find? And it's like, I mean, we, we haven't even scratched the surface. Wow. I mean, it's just, it's interesting discoveries every day. And just, and I'll tell you, they did not keep records the way we do. Hmm. I mean, it, it can be frustrating, but it can be very fascinating. And when I came here, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to identify every unit stationed at Fort Negley. I thought a simple Google search, you know, that'll. 11 years later, <laughs> I am still trying to pin wow. down all of the units that were stationed here because. Wow. And it, because it's not a matter of just looking in, you know, regimental histories, you have to. In, a lot of times you have to actually come across a letter or a memoir or oh my someone goodness. who's written about being here and then work backward from that. So Yeah. What do you think about the contrast of this what a lot of people come in here, you know, these people coming into Nashville who are new, they see a pit of dirt here in the middle of downtown. What do you think it's a pretty interesting contrast with Fort Negley and the Civil War fort in a, a, a thriving city just right in a, a stone throw distance away? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that during the time of the Civil War, Fort Negley was well outside of the city limits. Oh, really? I mean, this was... This it was, was on what, the, four miles from Capitol, from the Capitol, I think? 
Yeah, three or yeah. four miles. Yeah. So I, and now the city goes well beyond <laughs> Fort Negley. And right. I don't know, I mean, I feel like a lot of newcomers that come in, I don't know that they necessarily notice right. Fort y Negley. Yeah. I think they're, they're, they've been drawn here because of the economic prosperity and everything else that Nashville has to offer. And it seems like, you know, people discover the history of a place later. I mean, most often what we hear is I've lived here for 20 years and I've never so, been yeah. here. So I mean, that's <laughs> right. what we hear the most. Yeah. So, so I think it'll be a matter of time before, um, you know, some of the newcomers make their way here. Right. Um, it seems like people who are, who are visiting from outside who are, you know, they are on a mission to track the Civil War through the Western Theater. Right. And they come to Fort Negley, and they know exactly what it is. <laughs> right, And yeah. it is, you know, they have planned to come here. So, I mean, I... And I've only... I mean, I've only worked in Nashville for 11 years, but the changes I've... Seen, I'd like to see us preserve more history, but... Yeah. Do you, do you think that the, the more as a, you know, even not even a, a visitor to a city, but, you know, as a, a, as a resident of a city, do you think that, you know, knowing the history of your city, you know, has an important impact on the city itself? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Nashville has an absolutely amazing civil rights history that does not get talked about enough. No. Um, and just the, the story of occupation I mean, very few American cities were occupied and occupied as long as Nashville was. Mm. And it was, you know, it, if, if this makes sense, like it was a pretty successful occupation. Yeah. I mean, we, it, it was pretty amicable considering. So I feel like we should be, we should be talking about that more and also and also talking about you know what happened after the civil war and reconstruction right i mean we had we had we had this whole population of people largely forgotten today yeah and you know they were they were uplifted by the end of the Civil War, the abolition of slavery, the Freedmen's Bureau, and then within a matter of years of the end of the Civil War, you have a complete takeover by former Confederates, you have black codes enforced, and you know, and we're still dealing with those ramifications today. We're still dealing with the the segregation and you know the you know and the the gap between the the wealthy and the poor is growing every day so mm -hmm. i mean that, unfortunately nashville has a has a real history of um displacing african americans i mean it, it happened here you know, the, mm -hmm. the labor camp developed into a thriving little suburb called Rocktown, which evolved into, you know, thriving neighborhoods. And then when the highway came through, yeah, yeah, they were scattered yeah. to the wind, you oh, know? Wow. And, and it, it really severed that connection between the African-American community and Fort Negley. Mm. I mean, this, this place that was so important to their ancestors yeah and you know there are through um us tweeting the names of the the laborers on the the labor roll yeah you know, people have discovered that their ancestors oh wow built Fort wow Negley, but that connection was severed mm. yeah you know decades huh. ago and trying to trying to rebuild that and trying to convince people like 
Fort Negley is more than a site of oppression. It's a it's a symbol of freedom. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. That's yeah. Thank you so much oh, for you're coming on the show. Um, I'm blown away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the invitation. I yeah. Hope. Like I've I've been to Fort Nagley probably a lot, <laughs> at least 200 times yeah. since okay. I've lived here. Well, that and is great to hear. Like I like I'm I'm here like. I, if I'm looking for a place to walk and I don't want to be downtown near people, like I come mm-hmm. here and bring my laptop here to work, like oh, up yes. there, like and so like Fort Nagley is near and dear to me, but I've never heard these stories, and so it's it's giving me a better appreciation of this place that's yeah. literally miles from a thriving metro downtown. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's that's one of the you know you asked me about the amazing things like. You're surrounded by the city and the highway, but when you're on top of that hill, there's a lot of peace. Well, yeah, and you to like, and, and you could see all of Nashville, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. much, and it's just it's a super unique uh, hidden gem it here is. in the city of Nashville. Absolutely, and I really hope uh, people listening to this that you would come to Fort Nagley and experience it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's it's fun to watch. Uh, when you're up there, watch all the planes go in. Oh yes. uh, to yeah. the to the airport because uh, you can just see them off in the distance uh, to the south, and and they're just flying into the airport. You could watch them for days. Um, the sunsets here are yeah. are very hard to beat. There, mm-hmm. It's probably contested as one of the best sunset spots in the city for yeah. sure. Uh, they have a great view of the skyline. You can look in any direction and see a lot of. A lot of Nashville gets tough a little bit towards the, the east in that direction. There's a lot of hills that way. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place. Thank you for all the work that you've done uh, you. to help this place come along. What's, what's in the future for Fort Negley? Um, we talked about the master plan a little bit, but is there any execution of that master plan in place, like timelines? Um, not, not yet, okay. not at this point. Um, personally, what, what I hope to see here... Um, is a something to memorialize mm-hmm. the sacrifices yeah. of uh, the African Americans who worked and died here, right? Um, and a a community space that um, that will attract multiple generations, right? Um, and will um, you know, form a connection to Fort Negley and the history. We hope you enjoyed that episode. If you're wondering, when did you guys record this episode? Uh, this was pre-pandemic. Was this was December of 2019. Um, but still, the good thing about the past, the past never changes. So uh, we are thankfully able to still tell those stories and you're able to learn about the fort um, and you're able to learn about the stories of you know, how Fort Negley was constructed and a little bit of that history there. Uh, And and we're going to talk more about that with the master plan um, because we'll learn about the fort as we go through the master plan and what's being renovated. So uh, if you like that episode, let us know if if you still have questions. I know on Tuesday we asked, you know, what do you want to learn when it comes to the master plan? Do you want to learn more about the past and how it's affecting the, the future of Fort Negley, or do you want to learn more about uh, what's being done? But if you have any questions about that, leave that in the comment. I hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving, and we will see you in the next episode. Go explore Fort Negley in the meantime if it's a great day outside for Thanksgiving and, and you're in town. Tomorrow. There you go. See you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to Nashville Daily. To learn more about today's episode, visit NashvilleDailyPodcast.com. And to stay connected, head to our Discord and you can find the link at NashvilleDailyPodcast.com slash connect. Nashville Daily is now offering tours. If you'd like to take a tour of downtown Nashville, head to the link in the show notes or find out more details at NashvilleDailyPodcast.com. Nashville Daily Podcast is an Explore.Nash production, copyright 2022.